In Culiacan, Mexico, silence is not a sign of peace. This is the heart of Sinaloa, a region once synonymous with bustling streets and vibrant nightlife. But now, it looks deserted. The same city center streets that were once full of families, students, and vendors are now ghostly. Because here, the silence tells a story of violence. For years, Sinaloa, a Mexican state synonymous with the infamous cartel bearing its name, enjoyed a fragile peace. But that calm was obliterated in September when two factions of the cartel turned their guns on each other after a local kingpin was arrested. Hundreds of people have died in the violence. Sinaloa isn't some outlier. The scale of destruction caused by the cartels across Mexico is immense, with over 400,000 murders since 2007. How can we end this madness? The logical solution seems to have the police be even more aggressive. But what if I told you that more arrests don't stop the violence? In fact, they might make it worse. And what if I told you that cartels are not just criminal gangs, but one of Mexico's largest employers? However, the cartels also have an Achilles heel, and this vulnerability wasn't exposed by law enforcement, but rather by mathematicians. You see, for decades, Mexico's fight against organized crime has been like a giant game of whack-a-mole. You take out one cartel member and two more pop up. Arrests are made, drug lords are captured, but the violence only gets worse. But why? Why does cracking down on cartels lead to more violence? And if arrests don't work, what then can we do to defeat the cartels? The answer to this question may surprise you. The way to stop cartel bloodshed isn't by locking up more people. It's by stopping people from joining in the first place. Mathematicians used a decade's worth of public data on homicides, arrests, and cartel interactions in Mexico. This way, they estimated that Mexico's over 150 cartels employ at least 175,000 members. This makes the cartels the fifth largest employer in Mexico, right between the grocery chain OXO and telecoms company America Movi. So one of the biggest issues about cartels is that they are like a black box. We cannot observe inside this black box because we will never have a census for cartels. We will never be able to go into the city and count. Are you a member of a cartel? This type of survey or this information will never exist for cartels, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to come up around that issue that this is the most secretive sort of structure where they want to hide everything, including their affiliation. So we need to come up with another idea, and another idea is mathematics. We try to understand with equations, with a system of equations, how we see the, the cartel changes in size. And more importantly for me, how we see that despite the number of losses that they have through either killing or arrests, because they suffer a lot of those every single week, they still manage to prevail as an institution, as an organization. So if you think of an equation, usually you would say x equals 7 for some unknown variable, x, and then you try to solve that equation, right? Mm. x minus 3 equals 4 gives you the solution, x equals 7, right? Mm. But for the size of the cartel, what we don't know is the size of a cartel, mm. but we can estimate why it changes in size. And why it changes in size? Well, because they get arrested, because they get killed, because they retire from the cartel, internal conflicts perhaps, mm -hmm. and because they recruit. So there are four things that make the size of the cartel vary. And what we do is we try to estimate how fast can they recruit, how fast can they retire, how fast can they kill, given the data that we actually have. And what data can we actually have? With something super interesting is that we can use the data for the number of homicides in the country, and the data for the number of arrests in the country, the number of people that go into prison, and then use that data to try to understand the inside of the cartels in Mexico. And that's what we did. We take one equation for each cartel, trying to explain the size, and we got a system of 150 equations, one for each cartel in Mexico. We have 150 cartels in Mexico, at least. For every equation, it tells you the size of that cartel, 
and why it changes according to the different structure, conflicts, and so on. We take this, and then when we solve it, what we observed is how big are cartels, how much do they recruit, and how we see that they can still exist as a structure despite all the losses that they have. Roughly 37% of cartel members over the past decade were either killed or jailed. Yet there are more cartel criminals than ever. To keep their numbers up, cartels need to recruit at least 350 new members every week. That's every single week. The mathematicians led by Rafael Prieto Curiel, who used to work for the police department in Mexico City, found that even if arrests were doubled, this approach would lead to an 8% increase in weekly casualties and a 6% growth in cartel membership. The researchers estimate that if current trends continue, the violence in Mexico will worsen significantly over the next five years. By 2027, they predict, 40% more cartel-related casualties compared to 2022 levels and a 26% increase in cartel membership. However, arresting cartel members, especially capos, destabilizes the power balance between cartels, triggering more violent conflicts as groups scramble to fill the void left by imprisoned leaders. This is exactly what happened in the sun-baked city of Culiacan, home to one million people, since last summer when the son of the Sinaloa cartel's jailed founder, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, reportedly double-crossed the cartel's other co-founder, Ismael El Mayo Zambada. Zambada was arrested on U.S. soil on July the 25th, after allegedly being kidnapped in Mexico and delivered to U.S. authorities against his will. The ensuing war between the cartels Mayos and Chapitos has left more than 400 people dead and hundreds missing in just a few months, according to the state prosecutor's office. Many of the victims were tortured by electrocution and even hot chilies, while others were fed dead or alive to tigers. President-elect Donald Trump and his vice president, J.D. Vance, each promised to escalate the battle against Mexican drug gangs. How do you keep the weapons out of the hands of the cartel? We need a military operation. I mean, what's happening, what you're just telling me, we need a military operation. You've got hundreds of thousands of very fine Marines, soldiers, sailors and airmen who are pretty pissed off at the Mexican drug cartels. I think we'll send them to do battle with the Mexican drug cartels too. However, Trump's plan could end in disaster ironically making cartels stronger than ever in the long run. No one is saying that criminals shouldn't be prosecuted anymore. Instead, what the researchers suggest is focusing more effort on damaging the cartel's human resources process. Cutting recruitment in half would reduce cartel-related homicides by 25% and shrink cartel membership by 11%, the study found. This strategy, the researchers argue, is more effective and sustainable. Yet this approach is no small feat. Reducing recruitment means addressing the social and economic conditions that push people toward cartels in the first place. Young men, who make up the bulk of cartel recruits, often face bleak futures. Cartels offer not just money, but a sense of purpose and belonging. Breaking this cycle requires massive investment in education, job creation, and community support. Even if recruitment were to drop to zero overnight, it would still take years to return to the levels of violence seen a decade ago. The cartel population is simply too large and their networks too entrenched. But you have to start somewhere, and Prieto Curiel believes the first step is to properly communicate to young men what they're really signing up for when considering joining the cartel. Let me tell you two things that I find critical. First, in the past 10 years, it so happens that I turn on my TV and somehow in Netflix, they are showing these uh, cartel capos as the hero, yeah. as the person that is successful, that has all the houses, that travels with the cars. But that is not true. First, we wouldn't be able to show those sort of anti-heroes from other regions of the world. Because would you turn on your TV and see like, oh, look at how successful was Mussolini? I don't think so, right? For some reason, we find it okay to do this with the anti-hero from Latin America, but we shouldn't do that. Number one and number two is showing you a biased reality. Because when, it, when you see that member of the cartel being successful, what you're not seeing is that there are 174,999 members of a cartel, because according to my estimate, there is 175,000. The other ones, 
They are the ones that are not rich, not successful. They don't have the houses, they don't have the cars that are being shown in Netflix, but they are the ones that get arrested, murdered, killed. So we estimate that when a young person joins a cartel, the chances that they will finish death in the next 10 years is 100 times bigger than a person in the street. The chances that they end up alive in just 10 years has dropped to like a very small percentage just because you joined the cartel. And not only that, we estimate that in 10 years, around 50 to 60% of the people who joined the cartel will be dead or in prison. So that's the reality that Netflix is not showing you. 60% mm -hmm. of the times, and this is a reality for people that are 15 year olds joining a cartel, in 10 years you will be either dead or in prison. And this is what we need to show the kids in Mexico. This is the reality of the cartels. So every time we talk about cartels, we should show you, yes, one in 100,000 looks like this, but the other ones will end up in prison or death. And not only you, cartels use your network for recruiting more people. And that means that once they recruited you, they are super likely to recruit your brother, your cousin, your father, your neighbor, your, your network, right? They use your social network to keep recruiting. So when you join a cartel, the chances are that not only you will end up either dead or in prison, but you and all the members of your family. So this is the cruel reality that we suffer today. Let's deliver this message to the young teenagers in Mexico, please. It's an emergency, right? That is on the one side. We need to actually fix the communication and fix the message of what is the reality of cartels on the one side. And on the other, is it because they are poor? Well, actually not so much. Cartel members are not the ones being recruited because they are poor. So I believe we need more science to understand how are they being recruited and who is the one being recruited. Because if I show you a map of Mexico with the 32 states that we have, those regions in which you have more cartel presence are not the poor ones. Those cities with a higher cartel presence are not the poor ones. Those neighborhoods with more cartels are not the poor ones. So in any geographical level, it's not true that cartel members are just being recruited because they are poor. And therefore, we need to accept that we are violent because we're poor. It's not true. We can actually fight organized crime first with a clear message of what is the, the reality of cartels and second by understanding better who gets recruited and why. They are being recruited because they think they will end up like the one in Netflix, but again they will end up either in prison or in jail.